archives. Thus far, as I've indicated, I haven't been concerned with 
times and dates and places in which you had these conversations with Charlie. Uh, apart from his conduct, Again, just zeroing in on philosophy on life, if you see that the philosophy on life remained basically constant throughout this entire period, between the time you met him and the last time you saw him in September of 69. Oh, no, there was a radical change. I'm talking about his philosophy on life now, as opposed to his conduct. Well, I'm talking about his lifestyle. Okay, the way he... So there was a change in his lifestyle. The the black-white revolution, he had this idea since when? Since the beginning when you first met him? Yeah, it seemed to develop while I met him, and it worked up to a, it finally began to manifest itself in, in words that he could preach like that. When did he start talking about it? I can't really remember. In other words, it just, it just became stronger and stronger. So finally, it became uh, the book of it all. When did it reach him? Motivated. When did it reach its greatest intensity? Well, I suppose to me, it reached its greatest intensity when when I heard of the conflict and threat of the black man, the, the, the man who was supposed to be shot and covered. Yeah, now, what did he tell you about that? Now, he didn't... Yeah, no, he did, in the beginning, I didn't really hear it from him. I heard it through other sources. Mm-hmm. The Brian Lucas did Dennis and so on. The word had come back to us through a charge. Yeah. He shot the man and said, kiss his feet. I didn't believe it was Charles, but I heard about the part saying, kissing his feet, say, I love you, brother. That sounded like Charles. You know, and the man was just, just, just said, you could see it or something. Then later, Charlie said that he was expecting a reprisal for, for what he had done. It was their fact that it would come soon looking for Charlie to stand back for this. Mm-hmm. I mean, the black man was going to get eaten with Charlie for what he had done for these black panthers? Yeah, these people, these gun-carrying black men were going to come looking for Charlie. You know, he said, he said, I'm hot. He said, I don't know how long I'm going to stay here. I've got to go to the desert. I said, yeah, why don't you go to this? It's a good place for him. He said, that. Did he admit to you that he shot the black man? No, never really did. Just that he said that I'm hot, things are getting hotter, I have to get out of here, I can't stay here, you know. Looking at the land. No, but in terms of this black-white revolution that was going to take place, right. between the blacks and the whites, and it's going to be helpless skelter, uh, when, did, when did that discussion of uh, language by Charlie reach its most frequent uh, intensity? I can't really place it down in any kind of story. It would just seem that there, in the middle of the winter, because that's when I sort of thought, after I recorded Charlie in January, February, it was January, January, February, what year? 69. Yeah. That I you know, was uh, slowly part of the company. I became more involved in another recording project I was doing with the Beach Boys, and I saw Charlie less and less, and he began to do on his own thing. I mean, then when I started seeing him again more often, he was heavily involved with the motorcycles, and the, so I wasn't as interested then either. I was, I was working in yeah, music. It was just it struck me at the time that this was uh, it seemed to contradict so much of what Charlie uh, had done and talked about before. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to get into that shortly, but I, I want to know if there was any period of time when you recall his talking about helpers, skelter, mostly in the middle of the winter of '69. Yeah, late 68 and early 69, between the Gresham House and uh, when he built that uh, club out at the ranch, tore out some walls, yeah. put in copies and rugs and strobe lights and had the album and the record player. And one whole end of the, the building, there was a big picture of Helter Skelter. So Golar Watch in the desert, Helter Skelter coming down out of the heavens and the mountains. And I didn't know about that. Yeah, it was painted in uh, day glow paint and it was glowed in the dark. And so on. It occupied the whole end of the, end of the room. Very, very interesting. Uh, this, this was in one of the. This was in the big room that they had made. And it was in, it was in the rain. The club, yeah. They were going to make the saloon. Or? It was part of the saloon. It was part of the saloon. Knocked the wall out and made two rooms there, and they had couches and mm-hmm. a strobe light and the whole thing. And the words uh, "Helter Skelter" were written on the wall. Yeah, yeah. the words "This is Helter Skelter," and there were some other words too. And I can't remember what they were. Dennis, maybe. I don't know. We were out there a few times. This was written in any particular color. Yeah, vivid colors, multicolored, uh, day glow paint, the kind of glow with a real bright paint. Especially glows when, when you put a strobe light on or a white light. You can even find a dark maybe. Yeah, it, it was the kind of paint that reacted to the black light. 
know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know what that is, but you've seen it, you know. So it says Helter Skelter is coming down, is that what it says? It said Helter Skelter, and it said that it had a little like, a, it was like a map. Gore Wash, Parker Ranch, Mother Ranch, and Mountain, Death Valley, the valley, you know, and then Helter Skelter coming down. The whole why, why do you say Helter Skelter coming down? Well, that's what it was. You see, they had it like waning coming down. That was the Helter Skelter was descending. Yeah, yeah right. It was kind of a mural on a wall. It was almost as big as a wall, I think. The wall of the office. Yeah. It, was just, yeah, it was a mural. Do you know who uh, wrote Helter Skelter? No, I don't know who painted it. I think it was like a joint entry. And either there were arrows or the general effect of the mural was that the Helter Skelter was descending on this particular area. Right, and it was more sort of like a map. But this Helter Skelter and Black White Revolution, this was his basic fundamental philosophy throughout most of the period of time he knew. Is that correct? Right? Yeah. Now you indicated that there seems to be at some period a dramatic, meaningful change in his outlook on life or on his lifestyle. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when did this take place? And Try to articulate what I noticed in the spring of '69 when I started, uh, when I went out to the ranch, I was he was accumulating uh, motorcycles, a lot of motorcycles, and uh, he also was uh, after desert vehicles, like four wheel drive jeeps, down far and he had taken up a good motorcycle, which is a kind of big way was a contradiction? Well, before he had preached that uh, everybody had to be together, they were one, they were really one family, one unit, and the yeah, motorcycle guys were definitely not, they were of their own family, another family. Uh, if you were going to be with Charlie, you had to be with him, you couldn't belong to any other thing, you had to give up and yourself and come with him. So this was a contradiction to that. Also, the contradiction line of that, that he was accumulating uh, material wealth. And heretofore, he had rejected material wealth. Absolutely, he would give it away. I've seen him give away cars and trucks with uh, water right through his hand. Uh, he would get it and he would give it away as fast as he got it. But now he was, there was some effort, visible effort of trying to hold on to things, get things together. So the movie had a big truck, too, as well. He was working on it. What about money? Well, he came to with money when he needed it. I never. Uh, during this period uh, in which you wanted material things, uh, you, you seemed to want money during that period. Yeah. Yeah, if we needed money, we expressed a uh, desire for money to both me and them. What are you saying? He needed it uh, for lawyers, he needed to get the baby out of jail, he needed it to buy some ropes, he needed it to, to get his thing together so he could move from one place to the other. Off of the desert? Yeah, right. So he was talking about his baby uh, out of jail. Supposedly, the Mary Bruner, yeah, the child, taken the, either hers or Sadie's or both into custody. It was really upset about that. Is that the night that he went to Wilson and asked Wilson for some money? Yeah, that was one of the times. Yeah, that was one of the most. Uh, that was the, for the first time I really noticed Charlie was uh, like visibly upset, visibly shaken. Uh, it, it was like a wild man. Over at over Dennis's place? Over, over my place. Dennis. Yeah, you were living with Dennis. Yeah. And this was in what part of August? Now, so here's where I cannot think of anything that could make me pin down the time. It could have been September, it could have been August. But in any event, it related to what? He came over there for what reason? Uh, he needed help, he needed money. For what reason? Uh, well, I think primarily he said he needed money to get the baby out. Referring to his child with Mary. Yeah, right. And he needed to get the impound of a lot of the desert vehicles over the, the dune buggies and so on. He needed money. He needed, he needed legal help. He, was, uh, he needed help any way he could get it. Money, legally. And he asked Dennis for the money. Yeah. And Dennis turned him down. Oh, yeah. Right. And Charlie did what when Dennis turned him down? Well, he and Dennis had been feuding for some time. He was, he was very bugged about it. You could see he was. It was later that he came back and cut Dennis. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the slugs, the forecast slugs. Yeah, he said, uh, 